Well, it's always marveling to see how the Lord continues to weave things together. And um, again, thank you for the accommodations and the opportunity to be here and preach and be able to fellowship with you. It's been sweet for me. Amen. It's been uh, it's been needed. And uh, I don't know how to say it other than you know, preachers need love too. That's exactly and, right. Uh, so it feels good. And I'm going to do something tonight that, uh, that I felt last night that I need to do as I was preaching and teaching. I felt a shift in the air. Mm -hmm. We've been in the book of Haggai uh, the first two nights. And uh, we really did, we made it to, at least I, I'm satisfied that we made it to where I needed to, to consider your ways. Mm -hmm. And as Brother Larry just said, revival is not just for the lost. And we tend to think of that, that the revival is, it's, it's all about the lost, all about the lost, in which I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's sandwiched in there. It's, it's important. But I do think it's a revival for God's children. A uh, rekindling of the spirit, as we've seen in the book of Haggai, as their spirit was stirred. So I'm going to just close off this, and then we're going to go to the book of Acts tonight. And so I hope to take you on a journey with me, because I want to leave this together for you as I have meditated and uh, studied and prayed about this. And, and I, I want you to understand, before I start, as, you know, last night we had some visitors, and, and that was good, and possibly Thursday, Friday night, we'll have some visitors, and that's fine. But as Brother Larry said, and it's amazing you said that, because as I was sitting there, and as I've been walking around and saying hello to everyone, uh, we have some sick and, and some out for tonight, and that's okay. Because as I studied and I prayed today, I, I know that there's a soul in here that's a key to this message tonight. Amen. Amen. There's a soul that needs to hear this message tonight. Mm -hmm. So I fear not about where the Lord's taken me. Amen. Because as we'll see, he takes us where we need to be. All right. And I, I am thankful that he has steered us. And I love the book of Haggai, but I'm going to follow the Lord and where he leads. Amen. So I'm at the book of Haggai, but I just want to close this off for you so I sort of cap it. We may, who knows, at the end of the week, we may go back to it, but for now, I know we're not. Right. Um, but, you know, we were dealing with that about this people and consider your ways. And I read quickly as we were closing last night in verse 6 that you have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put, off, put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 8, he says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. Amen. Isn't that what it's about? Pleasing mm -hmm. the Lord? And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I made a comment last night, and I want you to understand what my intent there was when I talked about the Shekinah glory, how it was in the old temple. And I wasn't necessarily saying that they were looking for Shekinah glory, but they had great expectations. They wanted the glory of the Lord to fill the place and be there amongst them. And, but they had other expectations, and they had many things in their mind that it should be. And that was the older folks that had seen the previous but verse 9 really hit me as I looked at it this morning. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. And here's where I'm wanting to get to. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and that's with authority, sent Amen. him, 
and the people did fear before the Lord. So we'll close that off tonight, but what I want you to understand, in verse 14 it says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. You know, and he continues on there, and that's what it's about. That's what this week's about. Whether you're lost in here, or whether you are saved, we all need a good stirring. Amen. We need a good stirring from the Lord. Amen. So, as we look and we saw in Haggai, we know they've come out of bondage, and he's led them, and it was by God's sovereign hand upon them mm -hmm. that he led them out, and he put them over there, and he gave all the supplies. What I have felt the presence of this week is God's leading. Mm -hmm. And he will lead us if we will submit. He will lead us if we will be humble. But we've got to put the pride down and be stirred in the spirit. So I want to go now to the book of Acts and we'll be in chapter 16 tonight. Acts chapter 16. And you just bear with me for a little bit, because what I'm going to try and do is take you on a bit of a journey that Paul and Silas found themselves on. I was adding up right at the last minute. I got here very early, and I started adding up and thinking about the miles that Paul had covered. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about this revival meeting. I, you know, because I had to, I had to take one, two, two planes to get here. And I thought about the miles that plane covered as I got to peek out the window and look at all the homes and houses and cities and towns, thinking about the mass of people. Mm -hmm. How many people I must have flew over. Right. But here I am mm -hmm. at New Testament Baptist Church tonight. Amen. I believe the Lord leads in everything. Amen. I got to add up the miles, and if my math's wrong, forgive me, but I think it's somewhere in this range that if we start from Acts chapter 15 and verse uh, 41, and we work to where I'm going to be preaching tonight, it's roughly 935 miles that's been covered. So I went ahead and did a little GPS investigation, and I, I hit from here, from this church to my house, to see how many miles it is, it's 760 miles. Ooh. So 760 miles, I've come to Tennessee to be with y'all. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It actually caused me to tremble as I know the severity and the importance of this meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I want to talk to you tonight is about a man shackled with no stocks. Mm. Shackled with no stocks. We've been praying for revival to take place this week, and I believe the Lord has arranged this meeting. I do believe that I do not believe in happenstance when it comes to things of God. Amen. We started this week in the book of Haggai, as I've said, and our main emphasis was to consider your ways, to lay it to your heart. Tonight, I really do hope to share with you another example of God's power of leading messengers to the right place at the right time. There you go. And I believe he does. Amos 4.12 says this, Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do unto thee, uh, purpose, prepare to meet thy God, O Amen. Israel. So my question before I start off tonight is that Brother Larry said that he's in that lot, in that plot. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Are you prepared? Be sure. Be sure. You're prepared. Let's start here in Acts 16. And I'm not going to read it all to you first. We're just going to read and preach as we go tonight because I want to cover a lot of ground. But remember, my title here is Shackled with No Stocks. As we look at the end of uh, chapter 15, so we get the background setting to this, what has taken place, and I'll get to the reading here in a minute. I know I told you to get ready to read, but what's taken place here in Acts 15 is there was... There were some things that came up, and the Jews felt that they had to be circumcised. You find it in verse 1 of 15. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that as I was preparing today and thinking about this message. All the different ideas out there about how to be saved. Right. Oh, there's many ideas out there. We were just speaking of different denominations and what their belief systems are. Uh, I'm not going to go through them because they're not worth that. I right. think Brother Larry or somebody mentioned about how you find counterfeit money and uh, that, you know, 
with the interesting thing, to find counterfeit money, you don't have to study all the all the fake money. Right. You study the one, the real, the real currency. Yeah. And that's how they do it. That's how they can pick it up so fast because they know the, the real dollar. It's the same with what we're dealing with, salvation. Mm -hmm. If you know the truth, you don't need not worry about what everyone else is saying. But there's a lot of ideas out there. So they felt they had to be circumcised. So they were bringing Judaism in, in with Christ and saying, well, you got to have Christ, but you must be circumcised as well. And they were trying to add some law back into it. So they end up here going to council, going back to the first uh, Baptist church, I call it, but the first church at Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and they have council. And to many of those other folks surprised and have many ideas, uh, it was not Peter that did the ruling in it. Mm -hmm. It was James. He's the one that gave the final final say so on it. Mm -hmm. Peter was one of the problem, one of the people that was in there in the mix. So now we come to the end of fifteen, and that's what's going on. Is Paul's setting out, and you find in verse forty there it says that Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. But look at verse 1. Then came he to Derbe and into Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, mm -hmm. which was wrote, well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem, which is back in chapter 15. Mm -hmm. So we'd see sort of maybe something there that sort of would trip you up. But the fact is, uh, Paul understood the crowd. Mm -hmm. And he understood if they're going to hear the truth, that you got to be you got to relate to the crowd. And I think of missionaries when they go on the field. It's like this. Uh, we here in America wear ties and jackets and, you know, we do our best. That's We try to dress our best, whatever the case is. But when you go on the mission field, you can't expect a tribesman to come out and want right. to put on your Hager suit. Right. That's not going to happen. So there's some things that had to be adjusted there. But it's, the, the fact is, Paul wasn't saying, yeah, that'll add to the gospel. But Paul wanted the message of the gospel to get there. And Timotheus had some issues with it too. So anyways, that's what's going on there. So the first point we're looking at is to heed the call. Amen. To heed the call. So the journey began. And it comes along. He delivers the decrees. And, and, I, and I call that confirming the churches. And we see it there as in, in verse 5. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Notice it was established in the faith. Mm -hmm. And you can find back in chapter 15 what they basically told them to do. In verse 20, it says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication mm -hmm. and from things strangled and from blood. And someone's asking, for well, why? Why the blood? Because that's where the life, life is in the blood. Amen. And that's why we're, we, you know, I know we can eat anything we want, but the fact is, we're, it's not good to eat blood. That's right. And anything that has blood in it, wild game, whatever, you can taste it immediately. That's why a lot of people don't like wild game. But anyways, we won't go there. But what I'm saying is that Paul's delivering this message to the churches. He's straightening things out along the way, making, thing, making sure things are good. But watch as we continue here. In verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word of Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. So here's yeah. what we're getting to. They're, 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 he's heeding the call, and he knows, he knows what he's about, and he's, a, he's out doing the work. But he had a plan. And his plan was to to go to a certain area and, and preach. Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit suffered him not to Amen. do that. Amen. Because God's in control. And it's just as similar as what I'm talking about. I've been in the book of Haggai, but I, I felt something, saw something last night that I said, I know I need to take a turn here, and we're going to do that, Lord willing, the rest of the week. <laughs> but the fact is we must follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So we see that he had a plan, but the call is sent forth. He must heed the call. And we as the children of God must do that. Amen. Heed the call. Heed the call. We must heed the call. Wednesdays are tough. It's not just Tennessee. It's Florida too, folks. Mm. Wednesdays are tough. It's one of the sleepiest nights of the week. <laughs> it is. People are tired. It's halfway through the work week. Or maybe it's been relaxing all day for you. Whatever the case is. But Wednesdays are tough. Mm -hmm. But we must heed the call. because And, I, and, and this whole idea too. I've heard this. Well, that's man-made. Wednesday night was man-made. Well, we, we need to look back to who has the authority to meet whenever they want to. There you go. And it's the church. Amen. And that divine authority, that excusia authority was passed on to the church. So if, uh, if you all said meet seven days a week, guess what? Everybody should be here seven days a week. There you go. But the fact is we must heed the call. So they were obedient to the call. Watch what takes place here. Verse 8, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Amen. There's the call. Amen. There's the call. And I know Brother Larry has said, and, and I, I like that approach to it. He said, It didn't matter when you came. I just knew you need to come. Mm -hmm. And let me preface this tonight. Someone in here is the key to this message. There's a reason I'm here. Amen. There's a reason I'm here. I believe that. And I've spent a lot of time today with the Lord. I believe that. I'm here for a reason. And I don't mean it in a prideful way. I am nothing but a weak and base vessel just being used of the Lord. Amen. So I pray that you would follow me in this because God makes no accidents. There's no happenstance. He didn't just happen to find some, uh, some wild preacher in Florida to unite and become friends with Brother Lafferty. Uh, another wild man known uh, for preaching and getting out of the pulpit and these things like that. There's no accidents with this. That's right. Amen. There's something to it. God's leading. Amen. And I don't want that to slip by you on our midweek service. They received encouragement along the way. Watch what takes place. Verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Amen. That's why I'm here in Tennessee. That's why I'm here this week. To preach the gospel unto you. Amen. You say, but Brother Larry preaches it every week. Yeah, but for whatever reason, God has seen fit to bring me here to preach the gospel Amen. unto you. Amen. So it's very important that we're, we are attentive to that. So, verse 11, Therefore, loosening from Troas, we came with a straight course to, um, I always trouble with this one, Samothracia, and the next day to Nepalus, and from thence to Philippi, Amen. which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Mm -hmm. So what happens here, we see now, they are, they've made it to the place they were called to. When he had that vision, the man says, come and help us. Come and help us. Look, y'all been here. Amen. But I met a man in Georgia that says, come and help us. And it hadn't left my mind from the first time. He said, we have to get you up here sometime. I didn't know what was going on in his heart, but he knew that at the first moment we met, he knew there's just something, I don't know what it is. He couldn't understand it. That's why he pushed it off a year, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, he said, yeah, that was his second word to me. I, I pushed this off long enough. Mm -hmm. Again, not building me up, but we're looking at what God does with his people. Mm -hmm. And he uses his people to get his work done. Amen. So it's all under his hand. So what's the encouragement that comes? And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Amen. And we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyra Tyra, which worshiped God, heard us. And pay attention to this. Amen. Whose heart the Lord opened. There you go. That she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house, abide there, and she constrained us. Amen. Now, we understand, we just saw there in verse 13, he went out to where prayer was made, and I believe sometimes there was preaching that took place when the man was there to preach. I, 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 just, I can't prove that, I just... 
but I feel like that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, then what was Lydia doing there? I mean, she wasn't even saved. Because sometimes a lot of people are doing just the best they know how to do. Some people think they're serving God. I heard so many people say when I, when, you know, they, somebody say, well, this is, he's pastor over here at this church. Oh, yeah, you know, okay. And I'm like, how you doing? And it comes around because I'm going to ask him, do you know the Lord? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. <laughs> well, that's great. Right. No, so does the devil. That's it. <laughs> and I always tell them that in the book of James, uh, they believe. And they, they even get emotional over God. They tremble. That's it. Right. And then you go, you can, you can find the Gospels where they even say, the time is not yet, the time is not come, so they even know there's a time. Mm -hmm. there it's go. all over. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So she was doing the best she could. Mm -hmm. Do you think she might be a reason the Lord sent him on that way? There you go. I believe so. Mm -hmm. It's the keys right there in verse 13, whose heart the Lord opened. Amen. That she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So what I'm saying here is if we'll just do what we're supposed to do, just as back in Haggai, if they just do what they're supposed to do, you will get encouragement along the way. Amen. It may not be the final destination for your, your, your road and your travel, but you will get encouragement along the way. Amen. This week, I'll be a week of encouragement. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's an encouragement for me. The Lord opens hearts. Amen. Yeah. I know there's been outstanding preachers come through here. I don't mean pastoring, but I mean preach. But I also know the Lord doesn't always have to use the best dynamic outstanding preacher to do his bidding. Amen. You're right. And I'm thankful for that or he wouldn't have called me. But he, but he called me. He uses messengers to deliver his word. Mm -hmm. And he opens hearts. Wouldn't it be something, Brother Larry, if we could just go in there, just if we had like a master set of keys? <laughs> Wouldn't it be something when we get all our visitors and all those that would come with us and we just walk by and just, just, just unlock it? Amen. You know, just be able to unlock it and unlock it and unlock it so that when we hit the pulpit, I mean, people says, Amen, praise the Lord. You know, Amen. Things are happening here. But the Lord's in control of that. There you go. He has the key. All right. He has the key. But I believe what he has done tonight is he has drawn us to the area that really needs to be attended to. Amen. We need to get a full grasp that he is the one that opens hearts. And it could be that your heart is being troubled this week. Maybe your heart needs uh, unlocked. And maybe that's the troubles because you feel something happening there. Something's messing with my heart. Well, that's the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Working on the heart. So the next thing we see here, really, from verse 16 on, is we see the halt, the halt to the havoc. The halt, like halt, stop. Mm -hmm. The stopping, the halting of the havoc. Mm -hmm. What you're going to find here is pretty interesting when you read this and study it out. Verse 16, it says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, mm -hmm. which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Amen. And he came out the same hour. And then there was he came out. Mm -hmm. See, that's, the Bible's important. Every word's important. Mm -hmm. He came out. Well, it was a her he was in. Mm -hmm. And you say, but she was telling the truth. I mean, these men are there to preach the gospel. But you have to understand, she was a soothsayer. She was she was in divination, mess, basically mess around witchcraft kind right, of things. Right. It was like fortune tellers. Mm -hmm. And she was a distraction to what the Lord was doing. Right. She was distracting and making money off of these things. Right. And you'll see that's what ends up happening here in the next verse coming up. 
In verse 19, and when her master saw the, that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. There's a key. There's something important to that. Uh -huh. See, because there's some denominations that if their people actually got into the Bible and read it, they'd find they don't even need those folks. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because there's some people trying to keep the priesthood still going. You're right. You can go to Thessalonica right now, get out there with your sign and start street preaching and see what happens. See, see how these other Christian folk treat you. Mm -hmm. Amen. They treat you just like they treat Paul. Mm -hmm. You know why? Same reason. You put them out of business. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to come to me weekly and confess your sins. You don't have to come to me and be anointed and all these other things. Because we have the word. Because Amen. the Lord unlocks the heart. So this is a very important transition taking place. And as we will see as we continue on, we will see that this is by God's hand. Everything that has taken place, God is ruling in. Amen. The fact that we're fixing to see they're locked up and cast in the prison was by God's design. That's it. It's an important time. Very important time. Verse 23, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Mm -hmm. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. And just so you know, he didn't walk them in like they do now. See, we've lost everything now. Now we got to walk along and, and hold them like this so that we don't hurt their arm or pinch their skin or anything else because we, sure, we, you know, we surely wouldn't want to be intrusive to the, the criminal. <laughs> no, they, they, they threw him in with thrust. Mm -hmm. And it means, it means intensively. Mm -hmm. It means violently. Thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. There's part of your title. Made their feet fast in stocks. There you do. The interesting thing about stocks is it's uh, when you look up that word and you study it out, it's said to be just like maybe you've seen in some old Western movies or whatever, but it's a piece of wood that would connect their feet together where they could not walk and they could not get up and run. They could not do these things. It was their feet were locked mm -hmm. and then locked fast, which means held firmly. So now we enter the text for tonight and our message. He's, he's pushed all the havoc off. They've lost their making money program. Uh, she's had the evil spirit taken out of her and now what? Well, now they're in prison. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't know about you. We were talking about it the other night, but you know, at the times we have we have sort of a trial run past it here in the last couple of years. But I actually had to make the decision: Am I willing to get arrested for what I'm doing? Right. And I think, and if times continue the way they are, that'll be a decision weekly. Sure, it's going to be a continual proving and testing and trying, and mm -hmm. we're going to go through it. Amen. But I hope, and I pray, and I think we can, and I think we will, and I think Brother Larry will, and I, I believe other uh, good brothers and preachers that I know, I think they will. If we get put in jail, I think we will sit there praising the Lord. Amen. Because he counted me worthy to have me there. What a blessing that would be. I hope we can see this as I set sail here on this. So, the help that was needed was sent. God has them right where they're supposed to be. It wouldn't look like that to a normal, just a average American reading the Bible. It would look like, well, what a shame. How could this happen? He's preaching the gospel. He's supposed to be God's man. He's in prison. Go. These wicked people are roaming the streets. Uh, hello, America. Amen. That's where we're at. You're right. We're being suppressed. Don't say nothing. Don't, don't pray in school. Don't even bring up the Lord's name. Uh, but these people, okay, they can pray 14 times a day and stop work so they can. Because we must be respectful to all religions, except for the one that names the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Amen. That's the only time that we, we restrict things down. But that ought to tell you right there where you should be headed. Mm -hmm. 
As I told you the other night, uh, the, the Lord's church is headed upstream. It's not floating along with the current. The current will take you way out to sea and never come back. Here you go. But the Lord's church has the charge. So we see here, first off, in this next part here, in verse 25, it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Mm -hmm. An amazing thing that happens at midnight. Psalm 119, 62 says this, At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. Mm -hmm. I think of other things that's happened at midnight. We think about back in Exodus, what happened at midnight there? The Passover. I will pass over you. Right. The midnight hours. Amen. Exodus chapter 12. Well, good things happen during the midnight hours. I've been at Bible camp fast asleep, laying there in my bunk with a missionary next to me. And we're, I mean, we are asleep. It's been a long day. We've been ministering all day. We've been teaching all day. We've been preaching all day. Busy, busy times. But I'm going to tell you, there's no better sound than at 1 a.m. and you hear, Amen, in the midnight hours. And who is it but a girl about this tall, or a girl this tall, or a little boy, or whatever it is, that the Lord has unlocked their hearts. Amen. And here's the thing people need to understand, the deed's done. Mm -hmm. Pastor Pierce is not, hasn't done anything. But they want that confirmation that I got this right. And we're careful not to leave them. First thing I usually ask, what are you here for? I don't do that. Maybe not that. Maybe I'm not as, hmm. But I ask them, what, what are you here for? What, what do you mean? I mean, it's one in the morning. Mm -hmm. And immediately. Yeah. I need to talk. Well, we're going to find that there's a man that needed to talk to. Amen. We're going to see here. And why, are, why am I preaching this? Why? I mean, we're, we're a good established church and we're good folks. Why are you preaching this to us tonight, Pastor Pierce? Because someone in this assembly is the key to this message. You're right. I believe it. Amen. I believe it. Watch what happens here. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. Amen. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. I kept thinking about that as I studied that day, what that scene must have been like. Think about that. You felt the rumble, and I thought it was interesting. We were talking about the foundations in the book of Haggai. They've been laid and they're laying dormant, but now here's the foundations that man has built, and God can shake them and cause the doors to pop Amen. open. Amen. To the point that the guard knows he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's got big problems here. Because what people don't realize in the Roman law and the way things are handled, you look back at Acts chapter 12 when Peter escaped from prison, the, the sentence was death. Mm -hmm. But this man, this prisoner, was more willing to take care of himself than to suffer at the hands of the Romans. Mm -hmm. Because it, no one says death would be quick. But Paul. Mm -hmm. But Paul. Mm -hmm. Do thyself no harm. Mm -hmm. We are here. Mm -hmm. Think about the impact that man must have felt at that moment. Think about how he had to come to grips with someone else's ruling in this. The doors have popped open, the stocks have come off, and not a prisoner rolling around. There you go. Think about being a prisoner alongside of Paul and Silas as they prayed and sang praises. And we're talking midnight. It's been a bad day. They've been beaten on. The same guard that probably took a hand in that. They've been beaten on. I'm not talking about today's beating. I'm talking about yesterday's beating. They got beat on. Amen. And they say, we're here. Mm -hmm. Do thyself no harm. As they sit there with their backs torn open. They were beaten with rods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it wasn't little paper paper rulers. I mean, we're talking about rods. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the way it used to be. Right. Look at verse 27. 
And the keeper of prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Isn't it interesting the next thing he does? Look what he needs. Then he called for a light mm -hmm. and Amen. sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Pilate and Saul, Paul and Silas. Think about that now. He goes from killing himself, which is what he was going to do. He was going to take care of the business himself to now he wants a light. Think about what we've heard in the Gospels. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. We see the spiritual, the spiritual things coming out in this text. This man's in a dark place. He knows what his sentence would be. He's going to take care of it himself. But for whatever reason, these prisoners told him, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then he wants a light. The light had come. Amen. The light had been sent 935 miles. And it was God's purpose that he was in that prison Amen. at that time, in that moment. Oh, shackled with no stocks. Mm -hmm. Who was in prison? Paul and Silas, right? I would beg to differ a little bit. No. I would tend to say it depends on which side of the bars you're looking out of. What we have here is a prison guard that was in bondage. That's it, yeah. We have a prison guard here that was shackled and did not have stocks on his feet. We have a prison guard here that was shackled in his sin and in the bondage of sin to the point when he knew he failed, it was death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the wages of sin? Death. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ. Our mm -hmm. Lord. From death to give me a light. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that's where you are tonight? If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your first reaction would be of the prisoner to get your sword. Mm -hmm. Because I got breaking news for you tonight. You failed. Mm. You failed. You couldn't keep the door shut. Sin got in. Mm -hmm. You failed the law. I'm a good person. Have you ever lied? If you say no tonight, you have now. All right. Guilty. Remember, it's not through Pastor Pierce's eyes. It's not through Pastor uh, Lafferty's eyes. It's through the eyes of God. It's like the Ten Commandments, folks, when I was teaching children at Bible camp. Ten Commandments, what are those made to do? So we know the law is the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We understand that. But what I'm saying is when you take the Ten Commandments and you want to hold those Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments, it's like shooting a bow. I, I like to shoot bows. You know, I like to hunt. I like to draw back. I like to shoot bows. And I have a bullseye there, and sometimes I'll cut the edge of it. And you know what I say? Not bad. You know what God says? Won't work. Mm -hmm. You didn't hit the mark. Mm -hmm. That's what the law is. Amen. If you can hit the mark, perfect. And there's only been one. Amen. So therefore, you have failed. Amen. And if you choose to deny Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're falling on your own sword. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to. You can call for a light. You know why? We're still here, folks. We're blessed tonight to be in church. We're still here. Yeah. There's time. Yeah. Don't do it. Amen. Don't fall on your own sword. Don't do it. Salvation is of the Lord. I mentioned earlier this week, salvation, rescue, mm -hmm. deliverance. It's of the Lord. You say, but I think if I just do this, it's of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But Pastor Pierce, maybe it's of the Lord. Well, I've opened my heart. You can't. The Lord does. Sin closed it. Amen. These are important times we're in. Pay attention to this prison guard. So what happens next? He calls for a light. We know that. But verse 30, I think it's one of the largest questions that's ever been asked. Mm -hmm. 
And I think perhaps tonight, whoever it is that's the key to this message tonight, has heard the proper answer over and over and over. And if I had a sword, I'd have it here tonight, and I'd give you the visual of that. But imagine having, and their swords were not these dull ones you get at Dollar General. <laughs> so maybe my illustration wouldn't have the benefit, but their swords would cut paper. <laughs> imagine having the point of that sword and you're leaning on it. And God says, that's far enough. Amen. I've come. I've come. What did he ask? Verse 30. So the prison guard, it says, and brought them out and said, Sirs. Now we went from thrusting them in with a, with a, 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 you know, a form of violence to it, intensely thrusting them in the prison, and now it says, Sirs. Mm -hmm. Sirs. Brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that the answer that everybody wants? Hey, Amen. Right. I mean, isn't that why denominations are still searching for that right. answer? Some are still adding on to what you must do to be saved. Some are still trying to work their way to being saved. But this man says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul follows up, says, well, have you ever heard of the doctrines of grace? <laughs> do you, have you ever heard of John's baptism? Have you ever heard of this? You, uh, well, we're going to have a course. <laughs> no. And if someone's upset with me, well, I'm sorry, it's the Bible. You're right. You're going to find the answer right here following. And they said, what do you think it says? Be baptized? No. Know your doctrine? No. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. And then he adds on there, and thy house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's denominations that take that and run with it. And says he had all his little infant child, children baptized and everything. No, no, no. Paul meant it. If it's good for you, it's good for them too. Amen. If they'll believe. Amen. And you find later on he expounds scripture to them. But I think about it like this. I've been to seminary. Uh, some lived their seminary and I don't have a problem either way if you haven't been or have been well, I'm not going to argue with it, I don't care I'm, I didn't go to seminary to try to elevate myself above people I went there just to refine and be in the scriptures and just, that's why I did it I didn't do it because I had to have a paper to prove that I, 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 I want to preach, I want to preach, I got a paper I didn't do it for that I did it to better myself, that's all mm -hmm. I'll go a little further with it I put my parents through so much through school it was a blessing to be able to do that. My teachers wouldn't believe. But anyways, that's not about me. <laughs> Verse 32, and it says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Yeah. And was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set up meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Amen. The same man that was condoning whether he had a hand in it or not, I think probably he did. The same one that put those marks, the same one that was in league and colleague with them, that put the stripes and the open flesh wounds upon his back and thrust him into prison, didn't care if it got dirt in it or any other algae that was in there or mold, he didn't, they didn't care. Same one. You see the difference from before he believed to after? Amen. Now he's doctoring the wounds. Mm -hmm. He's helping them with their wounds. Mm -hmm. That's what God can do in your life. Amen. You say, but, but what am I going to do? Believe. But, but that guy over there says, believe. But you know, uh, that fellow over there, believe. Amen. That's what you must do. Mm -hmm. Because what I believe about this, when Paul said, and they said, Paul and Silas said, but before two or three witnesses, right? Right. There's two. With the man himself, that's three. Others around, prisoners heard him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I believe when he said that, 
he didn't have to teach the election because Paul already knew. Paul knew when he was thrust into prison. Mm -hmm. This is my horse. Right. This is my journey. I know why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul knew when he cast that spirit out of that woman, when he called that spirit out of that woman, and when they pulled him in and drug him in there and put him at the magistrates and they beat on him, I can't prove it, but I tend to think as he was doing it, he goes, I'm almost there. Mm -hmm. I'm almost where I need to be. We've almost made it to the place of calling. Because right. think about it. When he was in the prison, it says they prayed. They prayed. He's in the lowest, most inner part of the prison. Mm -hmm. Didn't need no rope to pray with. Didn't need any beads to pray with. Didn't need someone else to do the praying. They prayed. Amen. And God heard them all the way down there in that prison. And he answered their prayers. Amen. Oh, the power of this passage that I'm not uh, talented enough to illustrate for you. If we could only understand what took place there and feel that presence with them. Amen. When the Lord saved me, I, I didn't realize that I was leaning on my own sword. The Lord saved me by a way that some people don't agree with, but I know it was Bible. My grandfather was preaching on hell mm -hmm. and the realness of it and who's going to be there and what it might smell like, uh -huh. what it's going to feel like, right. what you're going to crave for. And the reality of that hit me as I sat over on that side and he was up here, that was on that side and, and they had this old army barracks that's just got four by four posts every so often through there. And I'd sit back there because that way I could hide my face sometimes when he was preaching and when I was getting convicted, I could just sort of hide behind that post. But tonight, no post was hiding. Amen. And he was preaching about hell. And I'm sitting there at 15 years old and I realized that my mother and my father sitting to my right when this takes place, my life's ended. I'm not going to be where they are. Right. They're saved. They're the reason I'm here. Then I look over this way, and it was much like this church, a lot of family. I look over this way, and there's my Aunt Judy and Uncle Billy Joe, and then there's my Uncle Jim and uh, my Aunt Bonnie. And I, I look over this way, and people that I've been from an infant brought up with and respecting these older people and just loving them. And I realize, you know... I don't, they're not going to be where I am. Right. I'm going to be all alone. And then he said, but you don't have to be there if you just believe and trust. Amen. And guess what the Lord did? Amen. He unlocked that old crusty lock. He said, he's only 15. It don't take long for us to sit in. You're right. It doesn't take long for things to start sealing up. <clears throat> went out into the world, went to public school, hung with public kids. Didn't live the way I should have for the one that just saved me. But once it's in there, it's in there. Amen. And I praise the Lord for his long suffering with me. And that's why I marvel and tremble and shake every time I prepare a message to preach to people. Mm -hmm. It goes back to 1 Corinthians. He chooses the weak and the base to do his bidding. Mm -hmm. Think about that now, folks. If you have not the Lord, you haven't even started on a journey. You're leaning on your sword. Mm -hmm. It won't take much effort to push you on it. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. I'm going to turn to the book of Ephesians for just a moment because I want, and, and I, I'd like if all of you would, I, I, I want you to see it. I know many of you know it. But for those that can't remember uh, Ephesians 1 7, if you haven't gotten anything else here tonight, I hope you get this verse and get it well, get it good. Mm -hmm. 
I keep teasing my wife. I, I have certain little sayings I'll say at church, and I keep teasing her about one. She's like, don't do that. So I won't do it to y'all. <laughs> but let's back up. Look at verse 3. Because before I went back with that, before I can read it, did we not see God's sovereignty in what we just studied? Mm-hmm. Paul wants to go here. He said, no, no. Mm-hmm. Go over there. Mm-hmm. If Paul would have followed his flesh, he'd have went where he was headed. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't have this account, but we know it couldn't be because it was God's will. Amen. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I don't know how people confuse that, but they do. They work at it. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. Having predestinated us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Mm-hmm. There's what part you had in it. The good pleasure of his will. There you go. 935 miles for the good pleasure of his will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Strikes on the back, open flesh, bleeding for the pleasure of his good will. Mm-hmm. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made us accepted. He hath made us accepted. Let me repeat that. He hath made us accepted. Amen. There was nothing in you. You had no righteousness. You are not righteous. If you have righteousness tonight, it's because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed on you. Amen. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Mm -hmm. No, it must be baptism. No, it must be good works. No, but no, through a good, good, just being good people. Mm. But what I want you to see is what it is saying: what we have redemption, or whom, mm. and whom. Mm-hmm. You know that snuff a lot of preachers out. You wonder why there's so many churches here and there and there and there and that. It's Satan working. Mm-hmm. You say I don't know if that stuff. It's in the Bible. They transform themselves into ministers of light. You think they stand up there and preach the devil? No, they use the name Jesus Christ and they mislead you far off track and you never make it to your destination. There you go. But when God's involved, nothing will hinder it. And I tell you tonight, if he's bumping on your heart, he, he, he won't be hindered. Amen. Christ. That, you know what that is when that's rumbling you? That, I, I just, I'm just i giving you an illustration. That rumbling going on and bothering you and saying, I think I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I got it right. Did I have it right? How could I have sinned and done that if I am saved? And all these things you're trying to figure out, your heart's stirred and you just want to know. I just want to know. You know what that is? The key sitting there going. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to go. Believe on the Lord Jesus Mm -hmm. Christ. The devil wants to stand on your heart. Mm -hmm. God does the unlocking of your heart. I'm going to go back to where I started. I believe someone here tonight is the key of this message if their ears were open. But I know Satan likes to stuff things in there too to drown out the noise. Mm Mm-hmm. Foul of the air has to come in and pluck the seed out before it can take root. Mm-hmm. You better have your safety net on. The Lord is speaking. The Lord is speaking. I'm going to back one more thing up because I, I really, I know, I, I know I didn't lock myself in a cottage all day today and pray all day today and stay in the Bible all day today. And I know that I didn't leave that property other than walking. I get around the cottage and go back in the cottage. I started to go for a walk. I didn't feel comfortable. I felt like, I know I need to be back where I was going to be, where I told the Lord I'd be. I'm going to be right here praying and studying and meditating and praying for this meeting because there's someone here that needs this. Amen. I want to back it up, so you just bear me two more minutes here. Romans 4 says this, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. There's nothing you can do to earn grace. Amen. It's his grace given to you. It is the gift of God. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Hear me. Hear me well tonight. Verse 6 says, Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without mm -hmm. works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities, you know what iniquities is? That's your crookedness. Mm -hmm. Blessed are they whose iniquities, I gotta find the verse, I'm going off of memory here, are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And he goes on there and he's comparing the fact that Abraham, what he did, he believed. That's all he did was believe. Now he disobeyed and I can show you that in the Bible. He he was a man. He was told to leave there and carry nothing with him. And he carried daddy and, uh, and, and uncle. And, I mean, he... It took him forever to get around to where the Lord wanted him to be. But as he was going around and getting there, you know what he's doing? Building a man. But here's the fact, folks. He believed. Amen. You say, well, he made that mistake. He believed. Amen. And since I've been 15 years old and trusted and believed, I made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long way to get to where God was going to take me. But here I am tonight in Dover, Tennessee. Amen. Let me drive it home to you. I drove stock cars for over 20 years. My whole goal was to get to NASCAR. I came that close. Mm. I came $20,000 short. It's going to run in Richmond in the Craftsman Truck Series. I was told if you run the top 15, as long as you don't, as long as you don't bang the truck up too bad, run the top 15, your phone will be ringing Monday morning. So you start off at $250,000 a year, not counting t-shirt sales, hat sales, everything else. You know what the Lord said? No. I had a sponsor that had the money. And he says, no, I'm going to be spending more than that on you, but I'm going to do it throughout the year. So we'll just race locally. The whole reason I ever started racing, my dad raced, and I just wanted to be my day one heart. But the Lord says, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be the man I'm going to be. Amen. And here's what I want you to do. You want to travel, you want to travel America racing, well now you're going to travel America preaching. Amen. And you're going to be guiding people and directing people. How could I have ever come to this without believing? Mm -hmm. It all started that night, as I said, sitting on that side of the church when I put my faith and trust in the Lord. I took a journey like Abraham. It took me years to get where I should be. But I pray tonight. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about, well, what will I tell my friends or this or that or what am I going to do? What I want you to worry about tonight is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God will take care of the rest. And I say it like this, that prisoner, he was fixing to kill himself, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the end of the passage you, and then you never find where he had to go back and tell everybody and, and say, you know, where'd all that fear go? The Lord removes it. Amen. The Lord removes it. Amen. I pray tonight you've heard the message. Within the message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you just need to be stirred to remember you're not shackled. You're a free man. And it's by your love of the Lord Jesus Christ that we ought to serve him. I pray you've heard the message. Amen.